Okay, welcome back. Let's now discuss what you just did with that hello world example. So here's the code that, that we talked about at the end of the last module, where you went through and you, uh, you typed in just that open MP pragma, put the, the curly braces at the beginning and the end. And just to be really, really clear on what each piece of syntax you added does, the pound include at the top defines any types that OpenMP uses and any function prototypes. If you're a C programmer, you're used to include files all the time. The pound pragma OMP parallel, we will talk about at length. But I'm just gonna tell you right now, what it does is it says, give me a bunch of threads. And since I didn't tell it, it's gonna say, give me the default number of threads. And I don't know, I don't care, the system chooses what that default number is. Then I go through and I'm using a runtime library routine to set that ID. And I go int ID equals OMP underscore git underscore thread underscore num. So that's going to give me an identifier for each thread. And it's going to range from zero up to the number of threads minus one. So it's a unique identifier for each thread or its thread ID. Then I have those print statements, print hello ID, print world ID. Then I have the closing brace, which closes that structured block. Remember I said structured block, you enter at the top or you, and you exit at the bottom. So that's my structured block that binds with the uh, parallel pragma. Now let me talk a little bit, before we look at what happens when I ran this program, let me talk a little bit about the kind of hardware that OpenMP assumes. These are shared memory machines. Now there's two flavors of shared memory machines. One is a symmetric multiprocessor, or SMP. In a symmetric multiprocessor, you assume that every single processing element has an equal footing as far as the operating system is concerned. There is no special processor. The operating system treats them all the same. There's one other thing about a symmetric multiprocessor. It assumes that there is no special blocks in memory, that all memory is equally accessible at a roughly equal cost from anywhere in the machine. So that's an SMP. The other class of, of shared memory machine is called NUMA, non-uniform memory architecture. And this is where you take into account that, hey, maybe memory is more expensive. You know, all memory is created equal, but some memory is more equal than other memory. You know, some addresses are closer to a processor than other addresses. So the, the access time to memory is non-uniform. So that's NUMA. So, you know, the way we draw the picture is you got this memory domain, you've got this network that connects processors, and it all looks nice and friendly, and you have equal access time to everything. Now, I just want to point out a problem here. So the last true SMP machine that I am personally aware of was the Cray 2 built in the late 80s. It was indeed the case that for each one of the processing blocks, which they called a head, on the Cray 2, you had equal access time to the memory. So it was a marvelous machine. It was very, very productive. And oh, I, I, I used to work with one of these. They were great. But that's a lot of years ago. And that was the last true SMP machine. Now I want you to look at an Intel Core i7-970 processor. Now this is often called an SMP. You will hear people call this an SMP all the time. You've got six cores and they all share a last level cache and you, you know they, they all share an address space, but is it really the case that all memory is equal access? And the fact of the matter is that if you look at the breakdown between processors and memory, because of that cache architecture, if a block you're looking at is sitting in a cache region close to a processor, you have much faster access time to that than if it's far away. So I'm just gonna put a little nugget in the back of your heads for you to keep in mind that even though we pretend that these modern CPUs that we have are SMPs, the fact of the matter is they're not. The fact of the matter is that when you think about an algorithm, you want to keep in mind that there's a cache hierarchy behind there. And you want to keep in mind that, you know, if something's sitting in a cache close to a processor, it has much faster access time than if it's sitting in DRAM far away. And that's a key part as you move deeper and deeper into this kind of programming. 
So with that little nugget out of the way, let's go back to talking about the structure of how the operating system manages the units of execution in, an S in a shared memory environment. So we have the idea of a process, and this is a diagram of the process, and it, sh it gives a nice little picture that you have, uh, you, you have a region of heap, which is the memory that you can manage, you have a data region, then you have a text, which is where the text of the program comes from, then you have an actual stack. Now, this is the structure of a process. Now, the way a modern operating system manages a process is it further decomposes that into threads. And it does that by fragmenting the stack. So each thread has its own chunk of the stack and maintains its own program pointer and its own register set. Uh, but they share the text region, the data region, and the heap. So what you have are a block of threads that share a process, but because they're sharing the sh they have the shared context of the process, you can context switch between threads very cheaply. So this is why virtually all modern operating systems that work on these shared address-based machines are based on threads. And it's kind of useful to understand this concept of thread, that the threads have a stack, which is their own little piece of memory, but then they have a heap, which is, belongs to the process, and is shared between all the threads. So when you put this all together, you get this kind of cartoon representation of what a program looks like in a shared memory environment, in that you have a single process, <clears throat> all the threads share a process, but you have a whole bunch of threads running, and they'll swap in and out. And you may have more threads than, than processor cores. Nothing says that you can only have one thread per core. So they'll be swapping in and out. You may run one thread a little while, run another thread a little while. The way you have to think of it is when you look at your program, you have to think about every conceivable way you can interleave those threads because all of those could conceivably happen. It may not be that you run thread zero all the way to completion, then thread one all the way to completion. You may do a little bit on one thread, a little bit on the other. So things will interleave in co potentially complicated ways. Believe me, we'll get back to that later. So let's look at the Hello World program. And with everything I've just told you, you should be able to understand the output you saw when you ran this. So I ran it on my laptop, and here's the output I got. Hello 1, hello 0, world 1, world 0, hello 3, hello 2, world 3, world 2. And each time I run it, they'll get in a different order. Why is that? Remember what I said. The threads are going to be interleaved in time, every which way. Each time I run this, I may get a different interleaving of those threads. And this is very, very important in understanding this type of programming because you, the programmer, have to make sure that every single way you interleave those threads gives you a correct result. And this is the challenge of multi-threaded programming. So wrapping all of this up, OpenMP is a multi-threaded programming language for shared address-based machines. Threads communicate by sharing variables, all right? You got these variables sitting in that heap of the process. All the threads can see that, so the threads interact by looking at those variables. Now, sometimes you have data that they're sharing, and you know, the, the sharing may not occur in a safe way. You may have one thread that's dumping on a variable that another thread's trying to read and that the result you get changes as you interleave the threads in a different order. We call that a race condition. And a race condition is the bane of multi-threaded programming. It's when you run a program and you get different answers each time you run it. Now, how do you prevent race conditions? You do it by organizing and controlling access to shared variables. You do this with synchronization. You have synchronization constructs that you use to protect and order accesses to shared variables. Now, synchronization is really expensive. If you synchronize a lot, you will get no performance. So you have to go through, as you design your algorithms and write your programs, you have to make sure that you synchronize as little as possible. How do you do that? By paying close attention to your data environment, by paying close attention to when you share variables and when you have a copy of a variable for each thread. So we have in OpenMP a whole collection of ways to manage the data environment and how it's shared. So these are the four basic categories of what there are in OpenMP. That you're going to be able to create threads that are going to work in a shared address space. That you're going to have unintended sharing that can get you into trouble with race conditions. You're going to have synchronization to have organized, disciplined access to shared data. And then you're going to be able to manage the data environment to hopefully reduce the amount of synchronization you need to do. 
Okay, now with that, we are ready to, uh, to go on to the next module where we will go through the actual constructs of OpenMP.